Hey guys, welcome back. We're at day five now with atoms and atomic theory. All right, and so let's dive in. Atomic theory, Dalton. So 1803. And so if you think about 1803, right, uh, most of this class is from that time period on, right? So this is a relatively new class when we talk about human history. And before Dalton, right, the Greeks had the four ironments of fire, earth, air, and water. Right? However, people knew more than that, right? If you think about it, they knew more of that thousands of years ago because they knew the difference between copper, silver, and gold because that was used for money. They knew the difference between fresh water and salt water because they knew you could drink fresh water and they knew you couldn't drink salt water. So they knew the difference between some of these things, right? But they didn't really have a way to describe it well that the average person knew. So now Dalton came up with, you know, a theory to describe this matter. And if you think about it, it's kind of impressive because we can't see it that well. We can't see these atoms, right? We can't see the individual building blocks that make up, you know, a pencil or a pen and the paper you're writing on and the, you know, the walls that you're looking at, right? We can't see the individual atoms. We see the collective and so all matter consists of atoms, and that is, without a doubt, what we still believe today, all right? Uh, all atoms of an element are identical. We're going to get into that. That actually is not true. They're very similar, but not all identical completely. Atoms combine in whole number ratios to form compounds, which is very true, all right? Chemical reactions are a rearrangement of atoms. This is a big one. Right? That's all a chemical reaction is, is a rearrangement of atoms. All right? That is, you know, and it's also a redistribution of electrons, which we haven't defined yet. And then atoms are individual, which that's not exactly true. All right? But this rearrangement of atoms, this leads us to Lavoisier and the conservation of mass. Right? Mass is neither created nor destroyed. Now... Because, right, atoms, all right, are divisible, right, this one right here, okay, we actually have the law of conservation of mass and energy, right? The number, the amount of mass and energy in the universe is constant, not, right, because right now where I am um, at, our North Carolina is a very nuclear state, nuclear chemistry is... Right? You're taking mass and making energy. So we're actually just, quote-unquote, destroying mass, but we're making energy, right? And so the total amount of mass and energy in the universe is constant. All right? Dalton also came up with the law of multiple proportions. Some elements combine in more than one ratio, but these ratios are whole number ratios. For example, N2O, NO2, CO2. CO2, all right? Those are just some example. Another one, H2O, H2O2, all right? Those are some of you have heard of maybe, like N2O, nitrous oxide. It's laughing gas. Maybe you experience laughing gas. Count to 10 backwards. And, of course, we don't make it all the way down, and we wake up later, and it's not fun. NO2, main ingredient, smog, all right? Not pleasant to breathe in. All right. So N2O and NO2 have vastly different compounds or, or properties. They're compounds, even though they're the same elements. CO and CO2. CO2, we breathe it out. Plants breathe it in, so to speak. They don't breathe, but they absorb the CO2 in the leaves and stuff, and they do photosynthesis with it. All right. CO, toxic to us. Water. All right. You guys know H2O, water. Uh, H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Don't want to drink that. All right? Don't want to shower in that, bathe in that, swim in that. All right? So, that's the law of multiple proportions. That we can have more than one option, but they are, they're different and they're always whole number ratios. Dalton also talked about the definite proportions. All water is H2O. All right? 
So all samples of a given compound, regardless of their source or how they were made, have the same proportions of, their, of the elements that make them up, the constitu uh, constituent elements. So water is always H2O2. Hydrogen peroxide is always H2O2, no matter what, which is neat. All right. Faraday and Arrhenius. We talk a lot about those two gentlemen in Chem 2. Formation of ions. What's an ion? Right? It's a charge. It's an atom with a charge. Atom with a charge. All right? So if, if an atom has a charge, right, we call it an ion. We're going to define ion later on. All right, next particle is the electron. All right, so there's a famous guy who flew a famous kite, right, with a key on it or something like that, right? And they talked about electricity. So Benjamin Franklin is credited with this, right? However, right, people knew about the electrical nature of matter, but we didn't really know about it, right? Because, again, can we see electrons? No, we use electricity like it's, you know, and we actually have houses and such that we really can't function the house without electricity anymore. However, all right, we didn't necessarily know what it was back then. Thompson characterized the electron in a cathode ray tube. This is where TVs used to be made out of cathode ray tubes, like when they're really big, right? When the TV is, you know, as, if not bigger uh, depth than it was width and height. All right, which is great. So then he had, an, Thompson had a model of the atom called the Plum Putty model. Another one would be like the Blueberry Yogurt model. And that was short-lived because Rutherford came along and had the nuclear model of the atom. And so Rutherford did this gold foil experiment. And I can zoom in on the gold foil here. And an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus right they're shot this way right to the gold foil right and this zinc sulfide screen here right the they have light flashes when it happens so you make this like a dark room it's kind of neat to actually see right and what the expectation was with like the plum pudding or the blueberry yogurt was right there's your electrons and most of these gamma rays just go right through. Well, obviously that's not what happened. A lot went straight through, right? However, it looked like these alpha particles hit dense things. Some came backwards, right? Kind of like baseball. Most of the pitches go right through, right? But some hit and some come right back, all right? And so Rutherford proposed a nuclear model where you have this thing in the middle that's a nucleus and there's space around. All right. So the nuclear model, you got the nucleus and in the nucleus is the positive charge. So the positive charge is in the nucleus and the negative charge is outside. That's the electron. All right. And so what happened here is the electron, which was Thompson, right, has a negative charge relatively. So these is relative, right? There's an actual charge on an electron, right? And that actual charge on the electron is like 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, all right? So it's really 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. However, relatively, it's negative one because proton is plus one. All right. Neutron is zero. So the electron symbol, a lot of times we use an italicized E, with a negative proton, a P with a positive, neutron, N, zero. No charge. Neutrons weren't discovered later because they, they there was a mass deficiency. So if you look at these masses here, 9 times 10 to the 28, negative 28 grams, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24 grams, right? 
and so this electron is really close to 1 times 10 negative um, 27 grams. And so it's a thousand times less dense, if that makes sense. All right? Or uh, not less dense, a thousand times less uh, massive. And so it's very, very small. So the electron's mass is very, very small compared to the proton and the neutron. All right, so the positive charge, you got protons and neutrons, if there are any, in the nucleus, and you get the electron outside the nucleus. Now with this, the mass, the mass is in the nucleus, right? Because of the mass difference between the electron and the protons and neutrons. And the volume is taken up by the electron. All right, so the space occupied by the, the atom is all due to the electron. All right, so now when we talk about classifying these atoms a little bit more, right, how do we know these things? So each element has a different atomic number, right? And that's the number of protons in the nucleus. It should be really and the number of electrons in the neutral atom. So the number, topic number is the ID. Think of it as an ID. All right. And the periodic table is organized in increasing atomic number from right to left. All right. So. E Hydrogen is always one. Helium's always two. Lithium's always three. Beryllium's always four. Boron's number is five. Carbon's always six. That's just by definition. However, we can have different mass numbers. Right? So that's the number of protons and neutrons. So the number of neutrons can vary. And some of these elements actually have options where there are different numbers of neutrons. And some don't. Some do not have. They only have one, what we call isotope. All right. So if we look at hydrogen here, there are three different isotopes. All right. And the atomic number is going to be one. The first isotope of hydrogen has atomic mass of one. And so the first one is hydrogen. All right. Now, we when we talk about the symbols, H is the chemical symbol for hydrogen. The number of protons is down there at the bottom. All right? Always down there. Okay? And if you want to write this out up here, right? We have the element X, right? The proton, well that's coming up, but the protons are down here. And the protons and the neutrons go up there in one number. And so for hydrogen, if the atomic mass is one, right, one goes up there. And all this has in it is one proton and one electron. However, there's another isotope of hydrogen that has a neutron. All right, and that is deuterium. That's why there's no D on the table. So of course, hydrogen has and deuterium have one proton, but the mass number is two. So we have one proton, one neutron, and one electron. Finally, there's tritium. H or T. Again, one proton. That's what makes it hydrogen, but a mass of three. So that has one proton, of course. It has two neutrons and 
one electron. So those are the three isotopes of hydrogen. Hydrogen, we use hydrogen as an example because it's the smallest element, sometimes the easiest to understand. So hydrogen, three isotopes, um, but they're not all stable. In fact, that last one is not stable. Again, I'm by a military base, a lot of Marines, and tritium is actually used a lot with um, sites for firearms. Like they, they're, they're radioactive, so tritium is radioactive, and it glows in the dark, all right? And it's safe, but like a lot of the police, they have these things called night sights on their, on their um, the guns they carry, and they glow in the dark, so you can see them really nicely in the dark. But they don't last forever because it's radioactive and eventually those night sights no longer glow, right? Which, well, why is it glowing? Well, that nucleus is not stable. So tritium is not a stable nucleus, right? And so there are some nuclei that are not stable, right? And it has to do with the neutron to proton ratio, right? And so the stable with nuclei of 2, 8, 20, 50, 82, 126, protons or neutrons are stable. You're more stable with even numbers, right? All numbers more than 83, atomic number of protons, right? Number, right? So that's bismuth. Um, so polonium on are radioactive. And then technetium and promethium are all radioactive, okay? Right? And so if you look... And we're not going to dive into nuclear chem much, but there's this line here, right? That's the line of a one-to-one -one ratio. And we start off one-to-one, -one, and then we start going up towards a one-to-five-to-one, right? Of one, ro one neutron to one point, or sorry, yeah, one and a half neutrons to one proton. Um, and again, that's nuclear chemistry. It's fantastic. It's very interesting. Um, but that's pretty much all our book is going to talk about is right now is is just basically that this exists, right? There is a whole chapter towards the end of the book of nuclear chemistry. So with this, all right, how when we've talked about before and the earlier is how do we measure these things? So how do I measure? Hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, all right? Because if I look, we measure in chemistry a lot of times with mass. Mass, volume, etc. Mass for a lot of things. And so if I want to measure mass, the average mass of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium would be 2, right? Because the average of 1, 2, and 3 would be 2. However, if you look at the periodic table, hydrogen is 1.00794. So when we talk about the mass of hydrogen, it is a weighted average. And you've all done weighted averages in math class, right? So two quick examples. Argon, most argon weighs 40. And so... If you look, 99.6 of them, so that's why the atomic mass is close to 40. Potassium, most of them weigh 39. That's why the atomic mass is close to 39. All right, so let's do an example of this, all right, with neon. So if we do an example of this with neon, right, the question is, what do we do, all right? Um... I take neon, and I have its mass, and the mass is an AMU. All right, and these are the three isotopes. So 20 neon, 21 neon, 22 neon. And if you look at neon, right, neon has 10 protons for all of them. So we have one with 10 neutrons, one with 11 neutrons, and one with 12 neutrons. All right. So we need to figure out how to calculate the average mass. All right. 
and we wanted to do that. So how, how would I do that? Well, I can't just take 19.9924 and then the 20 number and the 21 number, add them up, divide by three, that's not gonna work. So what we do is for neon here, we'll take neon as an overall, and we're gonna take our mass times the percent. So the mass of 20 neon multiplied by its percentage as a decimal, plus 21 neon multiplied by its percentage as a decimal, plus 22 neon multiplied by its percentage as a decimal. So let's try that. So we have 19.9924 AMU multiplied by its percentage of 0 0.9048. That's the percentage as, as a decimal. Plus 21 neon. 20.9938 AMU multiplied by 0 0.0027 plus 21.9914 AMU multiplied by, do I have more space? No, I don't. 0 0.0925. So if you do that math, I get neon to be 20.18 AMU, which is fantastic. All right, so that's how we do this weighted average. Now, I can ask you for that number in this. I could ask you for these numbers. A lot of times we'll ask you for one of these right because this number's on the periodic table right okay now let's dive into ions real quick when ions gain or lose electrons they gain a charge so again the protons here protons and neutrons up here and up here is the charge, all right? Which would be, if you think about it, the charge happens to be the number of protons minus the number of electrons. All right, so protons minus electrons. So if we do protons minus electrons, if I have more electrons, I will be negative. And if I have less electrons, I will be positive. All right, okay. And so if you look here, sodium, sodium is number 11. All right, so that means it should have 11 electrons. This sodium has 10 electrons because the extra electron is there. And because it's positive, we call it a cation, all right, cation. The electron here, chlorine, chlorine is number 17, so it has 17 electrons. This anion, we call it, has 18 electrons, and we call that chloride. So chlorine versus chloride. Sodium, we don't change the name. Maybe we just call it sodium ion if you wanted to. But for chlorine versus chloride, big difference, right? All right, so that's the periodic table. We've already covered the periodic table, which is wonderful. But as you can see, that is um, they're organized in atomic number, left to right. Now, I want to do a couple more before we get here. I want to do a couple examples of, of this, right? And so the three examples I want to do, I want to do Fe, which is iron, tungsten, and oxygen. And their mass numbers, iron is going to be 55. I can zoom in a little bit here. Tungsten is going to be 184. And oxygen is going to be 16. 
And iron's going to be 3 plus, tungsten's going to be 6 plus, and oxygen's going to be 2 minus. So I want to know how many protons, neutrons, and electrons we have. Okay. Iron, if you look at iron, the periodic table here, iron's right here with 26. So iron has 26 protons. Well, if you look at the mass number of 55, and so we have 55 protons and neutrons, so if we subtract the 26 protons, right, that would give us 29 neutrons. And iron has a charge of plus 3. That means there are three more positives than there are negatives. So that means if I have 26 positives, I have... 23 negatives. So that would be 23 electrons. For tungsten, if we look at tungsten, tungsten is number 74. So 74 protons. And again, if we look at 184 minus 74, right, because this is protons and neutrons. Minus the electron, or the, sorry, minus the protons, gives us the neutrons, and that would be 110. And then we're moving on to the electrons. I have six more protons than I do the electrons. So if I have six more protons, that means I got 68 electrons. Finally, oxygen. Oxygen, if you look at oxygen over here. There's oxygen, number eight. So eight protons. Mass number is 16. So 16 minus eight would be eight neutrons. Now I have two more electrons than I do protons. So that means if I have 10 electrons, right, I would have a negative two charge. And so that's how we do that atomic notation. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. There is one other thing that we can talk about real quick. Another way to write some of these um, uh, isotopes out, right, is you can actually write the number like O16 or carbon 12, uh, right, iron 55. You can write it that way too. But a lot of times I like the way that we just did before with the charge, if there's a charge. Well, that ends day five. Great job, guys. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you next time. Take care.